Greetings, friends. No, I'm not Ann Bullock. She's on vacation. So I am filling in for her for this part of the service. After this is over, then uh, I will continue with my regular uh, video sermon for you. Uh, if you have your, your order of worship and you want to join with me, let us begin our service with this invocation for the 8th Sunday after Pentecost, July 26, 2020. Holy One, you call us to find your kingdom already hidden in our world, in tiny, transforming possibilities, in beauty that calls us to surrender all, in complicated choices that call for wisdom. Reveal yourself here in this moment and heighten our senses that we may find you and join you in building this kingdom of love and hope and peace. In the name of the one who calls us to seek Jesus the Christ. Amen. And now let us call ourselves into this time of worship. The kingdom of heaven is like a tiny mustard seed that carries the life of a tree. The kingdom of heaven is like a tiny portion of yeast that makes bread rise. The kingdom of heaven is like a tiny pearl of great price that we would give all our stuff to have. The kingdom of heaven is like a fishing boat filled with catch, good and bad together, with fisher folk wise to recognize the good. And now we join in a prayer of confession. We do so because it recognizes that we are made wonderfully human, and a part of that humanness is our tendency not to always do what the Bible says we should be doing. As the Apostle Paul often said, the very good that I wish to do, that's not what I find myself doing. And the very evil I seek to avoid, sometimes I find myself caught up in it. So our confession reminds us not only of our individual responsibilities and our shortfalls in meeting those, but also our corporate responsibility as human, human beings, a part of the, all humanity in the globe, as we share in this prayer of confession. Gracious God, we are people of good intentions. We have good intentions to love one another. Good intentions to be a part of your kingdom together, to honor our words and promises and to always honor you. We confess that we have not always lived up to our good intentions. We are broken people, and we have broken promises. Forgive us, dear God, for the ways in which we have failed one another and the ways in which we have failed you. Amen. The assurance of pardon is to recognize that we don't stay in this broken state, this alienation between our self that wishes to do the good and our self that sometimes can't seem to find a way to do it at all. So in the assurance of pardons, we hear these good words from gospel. Hear the good news. God forgives us again and again. We have second chances and third chances and fourth chances to keep trying to get it right and to live up to our good intentions. Even though we sometimes fail God, God never fails us. God always keeps God's promises to be faithful. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we give you thanks that you are ever faithful when we are not. Even when we cannot mention your name, when we are in pain or sorrow or loss or confusion, you keep seeking us out. You keep calling to us. Again this week, we have heard and read of the pain and suffering of many around the world who are trapped by this horrible virus. We hear the stories of those who have no opportunity to say to goodbye to those they love as they slip into death. We hear the stories of parents who are bewildered about what is best for their children. We hear the stories of our churches and our church members who wonder, will we ever have church again? We're made aware also of the suffering around the world, of people who have no doctor to turn to, no health care system to support them, no medicine available to ease their pain. We give thanks for all who work to relieve human suffering by whatever banner they follow, by whatever name they call themselves, by whatever God they pray to, we give thanks that they are there to care, to help, and to serve. And you have said that if even we give a cup of water in your name, 
your presence is acknowledged and received. As we move forward, grant us your patience. Grant us your peace that keeps us safe. Grant us your hope that keeps us from depression and sadness and loneliness. And until we meet again, grant us your abiding presence. And now we pray the prayer that your son taught us to sing together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now the liturgy reminds us after we have confessed our sins and received God's forgiveness, we can affirm our faith, both individually and corporate, corporately. Together let us affirm our faith during this time of Pentecost. We believe in the Spirit who blows through our lives, unsettling us, stirring us up, propelling us forward. We believe in the Spirit who comes as fire, warming us, empowering us, remaking us. We believe in the Spirit who frees our tongues for talking of God, for prayers, for advocacy. We believe in the Spirit, the Counselor, the Helper, the Breath of God. Amen. Let me remind each of you that you can continue to contribute, and I want to say thank you that you have been. You've been supporting our ministry while during this difficult time when we cannot be together. Most of our programs, of course, have are going to have to wait until we get further clearance about opening them as you remember and participating in them. You know that you can contribute simply by sending your check in the mail, hopefully with your envelope that helps us keep our records straight and accurate, or you can do it online. I know that's the way I do it. Uh, it's convenient for me and it works, but you have your own way of doing that. The important thing is that you're doing it. And I wanna say thank you as your pastor and may God bless you as you continue to uh, give your offering each and every day. Our God calls us to seek and find the limits of the kingdom in our world and to nurture its growth among us. We will use our gifts, tithes, and offerings to rebuild the body of Christ. And now our prayer of thanksgiving for these offerings. Grow these gifts in your love. Bless our offerings, our hearts, our hopes in your love to make us worthy of your work for the, your kingdom in heaven and among us here even now. For these gifts and each of us with your goodness. Amen. And now we prepare ourselves for the reading of the scripture. Matthew 13, 24 through 30 and 36 through 43. Welcome, friends, to the service of worship here at the Haynes, uh, St. John's Haynes United Church of Christ. Thank you for joining us today as we move through our summer, waiting for the appropriate time when we can move back into our sanctuary. Uh, our task force on reopening is continuing to meet. We are now working on written specific plans that we hope to have ready uh, sometime in August so that we can communicate those to you as we discuss and try to figure out what is the best date for us to begin our reopening and invite all of you back into the sanctuary. Hopefully we'll be able to use our newly installed video uh, equipment. We are advertising for an assistant to help us uh, do this task and it is going to be a paid position. If you know of someone that you think might be interested, a high school or college student or yourself, uh, please call the church office and speak to Donna and she will uh, tell you about our job description so you can read it and decide if that's something you think you'd like to do. Uh, we're continuing to pray for each other, to monitor those who are needing our pastoral care, although you must understand it is difficult to do pastoral care other than a phone call, a card, or a letter. 
However, if you know of people who may be confined to their home, take the initiative, give them a phone call, say hello, uh, brighten up their day a bit. Uh, every bit we can do is helpful and provides uh, the concept that we are continuing to work together as a congregation and connect to each other. Let's open our worship with a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for this day. Help us to use it wisely, carefully, and thoughtfully. Remind us once again that we are all in your grace and in your mercy. As we listen to your word, help us to be attentive to its meaning. Help us to open our minds to the wisdom it offers us. And then give us the courage to follow it, to actually do what it says. We pray this in your name. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Matthew. Now, we've been in a section of Matthew. We've been reading this whole series of parables. We have one today that is what I would call the queen of the chapter of parables because it's filled with all kinds of images. In fact, I think there are six different images in this passage as we read so you can listen and, and follow along. Today I'm going to read from um, a, a paraphrase. Now, there's a difference between a paraphrase of the gospel and a translation. A translation actually goes back to the original Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic texts and begins there and studies the text to make a new translation based on our older manuscripts. A paraphrase simply tries to update the message in what we might call everyday English. Now, paraphrases can be very helpful. They can also lead you to some false assumptions about the text. So be careful if you want to buy a Bible, for example, for a gift to someone. Remember to think whether you're buying a translation, such as the RSV, the NRSV, the New English Bible, the Jerusalem Bible, the Good News Bible. Those are all translations. Today we're going to read a paraphrase which tries to update the language so that it has a more contemporary ring to it. Here we go. Another story. God's kingdom is like a pine nut that a farmer plants. It is quite small as seeds go, but in the course of years it grows into a huge pine tree and eagles build nests in it. Another story. God's kingdom is like yeast that a woman works into the dough for dozens of loaves of barley bread and waits while the dough rises. God's kingdom is like a treasure hidden in a field for years and then accidentally found by a trespasser. The finder is ecstatic. What a find! And proceeds to sell everything he owns to raise money and buy that field. Or, God's kingdom is like a jewel merchant on the hunt for excellent pearls. Finding one that is flawless, he immediately sells everything and buys it. Or, God's kingdom is like a fish net cast into the sea, catching all kinds of fish. When it is full, it is hauled onto the beach. The good fish are picked out and put in a tub. Those unfit to eat are thrown away. That's how it will be when the curtain comes down on history. The angels will come and cull the bad fish and throw them in the garbage. There will be a lot of desperate complaining, but it won't do any good. Jesus asked, are you starting to get a handle on all this? They answered, yes. He said, then you see how every student well-trained in God's kingdom is like the owner of a general store who can put his hands on anything you need, old or new, exactly when you need it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One day in my seminary class in hermeneutics, that's the Greek word for messenger, we call it the class on preaching, was discussing the structure and outline of sermons, a student asked, Professor, how many points should a sermon contain? The professor paused and then said, at least one. The text from Matthew today would have failed to meet that criteria as it contains not one but six themes in the form of similes and parables. The mustard seed, verses 31 through 32. The yeast in the flour, verses 33. The treasure hidden in the field, verse 44. The pearl of great price, verses 45 through 46. 
the fishnet, verses 47 through 50, and the householder treasurer, verses 51 through 52. Any one of these could form the basis of a sermon or an extended Bible study or discussion. When I read the text, I decided to look at all six of these as a whole piece used to describe the one point of the sermon, the kingdom of heaven. Scott Hosey of Calvin Theological Seminary offers his support for this particular viewpoint. He says, But even though Jesus is throwing out these various images at a fast and furious pace, He's also teaching one of the most remarkable truths that emerges from the gospel, namely, the unexpected hiddenness of the kingdom of God. Now, applying this vantage point to the text, several observations strike me and hopefully will also you as we try to figure out how all of these images form one comprehensive picture of what Jesus wants to share about the kingdom of heaven. My first observation is the images in this text are all drawn from everyday living. They're not powerful, flashy, showy, political kingdoms that otherwise capture our attention. No, the kingdom of God, Jesus said, looks small, even tiny. It looks foolish. In fact, the kingdom can even disappear completely the way a seed gets buried in the soil. <clears throat> This teaching by Jesus is not a philosophical discourse or a theological treatise. It's not a lecture in a seminary. <clears throat> All six of these images emerge from the common events in living which we all can relate. Frequently, especially in a culture which is addicted to the big event, the overwhelming spectacles shows, the Super Bowls, the World Series, the huge concerts that draw thousands, this message, it's easy for it to get lost and overwhelmed. Many are looking for the spectacular and miss the kingdom's invitation to salvation because it does not come in this fashion. It is ordinary and plain. It does not often generate enthusiasm for its message, but does promise a life in which there is an abundance of goodness, a consistent call for justice, and a continuous demand that exudes kindness and compassion and mercy. None of these are exciting, and some of them are even dangerous. I was struck this week with the eulogies given to John Lewis. One even referred to him as a person infused with the values of the Christian faith which he lived. He was not a preacher, but his life was a constant sermon and a call to everyone, including the Congress, of which he was a member, to what was right, what was just, and what was needed. He wasn't a flashy leader, but he was a leader whose values formed in the Christian faith brought him to issues and problems in which his voice for justice and righteousness was needed and heard. In almost all of his public remarks, Lewis sounded more like a preacher than he did a senator. He always called his colleagues to the ethical concerns, the moral issues that were involved in every piece of legislation they talked about. His rhetoric was born in the sanctuary, but it was delivered in the public square for all to hear and none to avoid. The kingdom of heaven is about the work of God in all of its ordinariness and commonality. A seed, yeast, a treasure, a pearl, a fishnet. You don't need to feel any pressure to make your witness blink with Christmas lights. You only need to give yourself in the common and the ordinary in all the daily tasks you perform. This will lift the cross of Christ and ensure the good news that we speak about so frequently here is going forth. A second observation is all of these images in the text point to responses to the kingdom of heaven. These images contain a dynamism. Seeds grow. Yeast causes flour to rise. 
A treasure to be purchased requires sacrifice. A fishnet demands effort to bring it into the boat or onto the shore. These are all action images and they speak of faith which requires our action and our response. In my many discussions with younger folk, this is a constant theme. The church never does anything. It's boring. This text does help us in, this, in responding because it points to the kinds of things which may appear boring, but once engaged can capture the whole of one's life. What I've said is a response is that faith is not always something concrete and visible. However, our response as an individual Christian or as the church certainly is. Our involvement then makes a difference which can be concrete and visible. Most of our lives never reach the spectacular stage. We don't make the competition to the voice. I don't know if any of you have done that. We don't win Jeopardy. I haven't seen that happen. Or we have not been elected president of the United States. Some may say they're grateful for that. But we have to live and we have decisions to make and faith provides us with both a foundation and a strategy to do it in ways which bring hope and healing and even salvation. Theologically, Talitha Arnold says the text helps us to see the incarnation of Jesus more humanly and in a way more believable. She says this, of course that's the whole point. As Christians we're called to believe in the incarnation the mystery of the meeting of the divine and the human in the person of Jesus Christ. In his parables, Jesus puts that incarnational focus not on himself, but on the world around him. The most common things in human life. Like Jesus himself, this everyday world embodies the sacred meeting of divine and human, if only we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. This aspect of Jesus' teaching and use of parable also separates it from the well-known fables or Aesop's tales in world literature. Unlike Greek and Roman myths, Jesus' stories have no gods in human disguise or talking animals, only real-life women and men going about their everyday life, needing flour, planting seeds. The kingdom of God is here, Jesus says. In fact, he goes further to say it's within you. It's in the everyday, the common. This is where you will find it, and this is where you are called to live it. My third observation is to look at the outcome of the images. The seed grows into a bush over eight feet high. The yeast turns a small lump into a large loaf of bread, feeding many people. These are images which project outcomes beyond anything we could imagine. Here the gospel tells us of the extravagant nature of God's response to us. That's the other side of the kingdom. This abundance is a constant theme in the whole of the Bible. God blesses. And when we are in the position we should be to receive it, it is an abundant blessing, as Jesus told us in these images from Matthew. Their sources, again as the text reminds us, cannot be found on Wall Street or the board meetings of Google and Facebook, though I think they could use some of us on their boards for some common sense decisions, certainly some ethical and moral ones. It may be found, however, in the common, the ordinary, the very things we dismissed, what is rejected, 1 Peter 2.7 speaks of Jesus as being the rejected stone for the building, does in fact become the cornerstone. It tells us that God uses what has been rejected, what is small, what is in, apparently looking like insignificance, becomes the very foundation of faith itself. Most of the Christian community speaks of the kingdom of heaven as something at the end of life. It's, it's conversation for funerals, not for everyday Sunday sermons. It's a place where all Christians will dwell in peace. And this 
is, of course, our hope. We speak of it in our affirmations. But Jesus has reminded us in the text for today, heaven is not out there or up there, but here, before us in real time and space. In a poignant essay entitled The Classic, The Christian Hope by Bishop A.T. John A.T. Robinson, he says this about it. Christians are those whose hope is from heaven, not for heaven, or rather, not for heaven as opposed to the earth. Their promise is of a renovated cosmos, which will include a new heaven and a new earth, an order that is to say, in which all things spiritual and material shall be fully reconciled in Christ. It is a hope for history, not a release from history. That's the challenge, isn't it? To live in the history and shape it as is being made. I had a history professor once who said, when you're reading history texts and you reach a place where it becomes so boring it puts you to sleep, that's when you need to be awake because history is often made in small, insignificant events. We don't need to wait for some significant moment. We're in one now. When all the resources of our mercy and kindness and compassion are called to be exercised. We don't need to be asked to do it. It's our instinct as a Christian community to do it. And that's the essence of the kingdom. That's what Jesus, I think, is talking about here. That's when those who are non-believers see what can't be seen in any other way. We are the best parable, aren't we? You are the best parable of bringing the good news of the gospel to everyone you meet. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks that in these moments, brief though they may be, we share the faith. We're called to be deeper in our faith. We're called to be, to find another level of spirituality. We're called to increase our service, not decrease it. Grant us wisdom and grace for the living of these days. Amen. Even if you've seen this service, we hope you can join us at our Sunday morning service at 9.30 a.m. in the parking lot at St. John's Haynes Church. Now receive these words of benediction. Go forth in wisdom and hope and courage with hearts open to recognize the signs of the kingdom of God in our midst and courage to create more space for grace in our lives and our world as we live into our new normal. Now may the peace of Christ be with you. May God's grace fill your lives, undergird your lives as you live in this new day, for it is a new day. And that peace is not as the world gives it, subject to all kinds of human conditions and contractual fine print. It is the peace that comes from God, which reminds you we're all in God's hands now and forever. Amen.